Hello and welcome to this lecture on hypothesis testing. After this lecture, students will be able to describe the assumptions of statistical hypothesis testing, define and apply the components in hypothesis testing, explain what it means to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis, finally calculate and determine the significance of t-test and z-test statistics. Whenever we hypothesis test or test our hypotheses, we are going to go through five steps. The first is we're going to make and state any assumptions about that test that we need to have. Then we will state our research and null hypotheses and our selected alpha or significance level for that test. Next we will select the sampling distribution and specify the test statistic. Then compute that test statistic. And finally make a decision and interpret the results for that test statistic. Let's start with the assumptions of hypothesis testing. Whenever we're going to test a hypothesis, we're going to make some assumptions about that test. The first one here is that we're going to assume that our sample was selected through random selection, that we have some sort of random sampling going on. The second one we're going to do is that if we cannot assume that our population is normally distributed, which in general we are not going to have a population that is normally distributed, However, we can assume that if our sample is large enough, n is over 50 or our number of cases is over 50, that our sampling distribution of the mean and or proportion will begin to approximate normal. What this means is that based on the central limit theorem, as long as our sample size is large enough, then we don't have to worry about the fact that our population isn't normally distributed because our sampling distribution will be normally distributed. Our next assumption is if our dependent variable is interval or ratio, our hypothesis is going to be about means. However, if our dependent variable is nominal and or ordinal, our hypothesis is going to be about proportions or percentages. Our next step is to state our research hypotheses. The research hypothesis is going to be reflecting the substantive hypothesis. It is our prediction. It is always going to be expressed in terms of the population parameter, but its specific form varies from test to test. For t-test and z-test, we express this as a difference. In general, the research hypothesis is specifying that the population parameter is one of the following, not equal to some specific value, so our population parameter is not equal to some specified value, that our population parameter is greater than the specified value or is less than the specified value. If we are saying that the population parameter is not equal to some specified value, this is called a two-tailed test. And it's for when we do not know the direction of the difference between our population parameter and the value we've selected. However, if we are specifying a direction, either that our population parameter is greater than some specified value or is less than the specified value, then we are doing what is called a one-tailed test. These can be right-tailed when we say that the population parameter is greater, or left-tailed when we say that the population parameter is less than. Whenever we have a research hypothesis, we also need to have a null hypothesis, or the opposite of our research hypothesis. The null hypothesis, or h sub 0, is a statement of no difference, which contradicts the research hypothesis and is expressed in terms of population parameters. In general, the null hypothesis states that there is no difference. This is true regardless of if our research hypothesis is one or two-tailed. So in almost every case, we're going to have our null hypothesis being that our population parameter is not different or is equal to our specified value, in contrast to our research hypothesis, which generally states that it is different or greater than or less than that specified value. With our null hypothesis, we're just saying that they are not different or that they are equal. Whenever we do hypothesis testing, we need to decide how certain we want to be in our result. In other words, how much risk are we willing to take that we are wrong? This is typically expressed in terms of a probabilistic value known as an alpha value. An alpha is the level of probability at which the null hypothesis is rejected. 
It is usually set at 0 0.05, 0 0.01, or 0 0.001. This means we would incorrectly reject the null hypothesis 5%, 1%, or 0.1% of the time, respectively. The lower the alpha value, the less likely we are to reject the null hypothesis. And then we have two types of error associated with this. We have type 1 error, which is when we reject the null hypothesis, when the null hypothesis is true. So that means that we are saying that there is a difference between our two values, between our population parameter and the value specified, when there really isn't. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference. This is the type of error that we control through an alpha value. Next we have type 2 error, which is when we fail to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. So this is when there actually is a difference between our population parameter and the specified value, but we conclude that there isn't a difference and that these two values are equal and therefore we fail to reject the null hypothesis. In order to calculate if any differences we see between the sample mean and the population parameter are statistically significant, we need to do a few things. First, we need to calculate the standard deviation or standard error of the sampling distribution. We need to calculate a z-score or t-statistic for the sample mean or probability, depending on the type of test we're going to do. And finally, we're going to use the z-score table or t-score uh, table to look up the p-value or area beyond the z-score. And we'll go over this in more detail in just a moment. So let's talk about what hypothesis testing looks like when we know the population standard deviation. Again, this isn't typical. We don't typically know the population standard deviation. But in this example, let's pretend we do. And so here's the formula up at the top where we have the z-score as being equal to uh, the mean that we have for our sample minus the population or the specified value we're interested in, divided by the standard deviation, which is then divided by the square root of the sample size. Essentially, this is the derivation of the formula we went over in chapter five when we talked about z-scores, but modified for the fact that we are not using it, the population data, but are instead using the sample. Once we've calculated the z-statistic, you can look up the p-value for your sample statistic in the table in Appendix B. The p-value is the probability of getting the sample statistic you got if the null hypothesis is true. Another way of stating this is that a p-value is the probability of our type 1 error, where we would incorrectly reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. The smaller the p-value, the more confident we are in rejecting the null. We can then compare our p-value that we looked up in Appendix B to our alpha value. If our p-value is larger, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. If our p-value is smaller than our alpha, we will reject the null hypothesis. So once again, if our p-value is larger, then we're going to fail to reject. If our p-value is smaller than our alpha, we will reject. All right, so let's look at a more common type of hypothesis testing when we do not know the population standard deviation. So frequently we don't know the population standard deviation. When this is the case, we're not going to calculate a z-statistic. Instead, what we're going to do is calculate a t-statistic. The t-statistic is computed to test the null hypothesis about a population mean when the population standard deviation is unknown and is estimated using the sample standard deviation instead. We can do this if our sample size is greater than 50. So here we're going to get the t statistic is going to be equal to the mean of our sample minus the specified value divided by our standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of n. After we've calculated this t statistic, we also need to calculate something else, which is called the degrees of freedom, which gives us an idea of how much our sample is going to be allowed to vary. And that's going to be equal to n, the number of cases in our sample, minus 1. And so in this case, t is the number of standard deviation units that our sample mean is from the hypothesized value, while uh, mu, or the population parameter, and y bar are, is the sample mean. We essentially replace the population standard deviation we discussed in the previous slide with the sample standard deviation, s. We can then look up the significance level for the calculated t statistic and calculated degrees of freedom. This is located in Appendix C. And here is our Appendix C. You will notice that on the left side here is the degrees of freedom. 
this is how much our sample could potentially vary. And then across here at the top, we have the level of significance or alpha value that we're going to be using. So if we say do a two-tailed test with an alpha value of 0.05 and we have 20 degrees of freedom, then the T statistic that we would need to be larger than for us to reject the null hypothesis is 2.086. So if our T score or T statistic is greater than 2.086 when we have 20 degrees of freedom and a significance level of 0.05 for a two-tail test, then we will reject the null hypothesis. If on the other hand, our calculated T statistic is less than 2.086, then we are going to, at this confidence level, at least at this alpha value of 0.05, we will then fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means there's probably no difference between our population parameter and the value we specified to compare it against. All right, so far we've talked about how we can compare our sample to a specified value to see if our population parameter is greater or different or less than some specified value. However, what if we want to compare two populations using two different samples? Then we're going to have a, a little bit different of a calculation. First, our assumptions. We are going to argue that we have independent samples, which means they are selected independently from each other, with both samples having more than 50 cases. We're also assuming, again, interval and ratio level data, and that the population variances are equal, or at least very close. Second, our null hypothesis is going to be that these samples are equal, and our research hypothesis can be not equal, greater, or less. Finally, we have a lot of estimation to do whenever we are using two samples, which means we're going to have larger margins of error, and we're going to have to do a different set of calculations in order to calculate what is called the pooled standard deviations. Let's talk about how to calculate the t-statistic here when we're comparing two samples the first thing we're going to need to do is calculate the pooled standard error, which is standard area of the mean of our first sample minus the mean of our second sample here. And that's going to be equal to this formula here, which I'm not going to read out loud. What I will say is that n sub 1 is the number of cases in our first sample, while s sub 1 is the standard deviation for our first sample, while n sub 2 is the number of cases in our second sample, and you guessed it, uh, S sub 2 is the standard deviation for our second sample. From that, we're going to plug this into the bottom of our t statistic calculation so that we have the mean of our first sample minus the mean of our second sample divided by this standard error, or this pooled standard error here. Finally, we're going to need to calculate the degrees of freedom for both of these samples combined, and so we're going to add the number of cases in our first sample plus the number of cases in our second sample and subtract two because we have two different samples. Finally, we can use this information, our t statistic and our degrees of freedom, to look up the t critical value in appendix C to see if our t statistic is significant or greater than that t critical value. All right, so far we've talked about hypothesis testing with means, comparing mean to a specified value or comparing two means. Let's talk about hypothesis testing with proportions. A lot of the same assumptions are going to apply. We have independent samples with an n of greater than 50, but our level of measurement here is going to be nominal or ordinal, some sort of categorical measure. We're then going to state our hypotheses, which again are going to be very similar, that the proportions are equal for the null hypothesis or that the proportions are not equal or greater than or less than but the calculations are going to be a little different. We're going to be calculating z scores again. And so our z formula, our formula for that z statistic is going to be equal to the proportion of from our sample one minus the proportion from our second sample divided by the pooled standard error of the proportions, which is calculated here. Very similar to how we calculated the standard error for our two means in the previous example. Again, where p sub one is the proportion for our first sample, p sub 2 is the proportion for our second sample, and n sub 1 is the number of cases for our first sample, and n sub 2 is the number of cases for our second sample. Next we are going to compare our test statistic, or z-score here, with our table in appendix b 
to see if we have a statistical significant result, right? Comparing it to our alpha. All right, so what does this look like in an actual example? So let's look at this first example. In this first example, we have a sample of 250 white women who work full time. We found that their mean earnings were $45,000 a year with a standard deviation of 20,000. We know from census data that the mean earnings for all women, regardless of race, who work full time is $40,000 with an unknown standard deviation. We want to know if our sample of white women is higher than the population. So again, here we have some population information that $40,000 for all women working full time, but we don't know the population standard deviation. So what we want to know is, does the population of white women make more than the population of women overall? And so we have some assumptions we're going to make. We're going to assume that the 250 white women were randomly selected, were randomly sampled. We can see that our uh, n is greater than 50. We have 250 cases. And we are indeed working with interval or ratio level measurement because we're looking at income or dollars. And so next we're going to state our hypotheses and alpha. Our alpha will be 0.05. That's a pretty typical alpha. It's moderately conservative, but not very conservative. And what we're saying here is that there's a 5% chance that we are incorrect, that uh, we are incorrect that these uh, white women make more than women overall. And then we're going to state our research and null hypotheses. Our research hypothesis is that the population for white women will have a higher mean earnings than the population of women overall. And that's going to be written as H sub 1 is going to be the population of white women is going to earn greater than $40,000 per year. Our null hypothesis is that the population of white women will not have a statistically significant difference in mean earnings from that of women overall. And so our population of white women will make around $40,000. Next, we're going to talk about which sort of sampling distribution we're going to be using. And because we do not know the population standard deviation, we know that we're going to be using a t distribution, which means we're going to be working with a t statistic. That means we're going to need to compute a t statistic. So here's our formula. We have t is going to equal to our sample mean minus that uh, specified value, again 40,000 in this example, divided by our standard deviation divided by the square root of our number of cases. And so we end up with $45,000 minus $40,000. So our sample mean minus the specified value we selected earlier, divided by our standard deviation of $20,000 divided by the square root of 250. And that leaves us with $5,000, again this difference here, divided by 20,000 divided by 15.81, which after we do all our calculations leaves us with a t statistic of 3.95. Next we're going to calculate our degrees of freedom, which is n minus 1, 250 minus 1 equals 249. So our next step, now that we have our t statistic, our alpha of 0.05 and our degrees of freedom is we're going to go look at that table for our t values. All right, so here's our table for our t values. We're doing a one tail test because we are looking at if the population of white women is larger or higher earning than the population of women overall. And so that's going to be 0.05. Here's our alpha. And our degrees of freedom here, you notice it isn't listed. They only go up to 120 degrees of freedom, and we have 249. And so we're going to use this infinite degrees of freedom here, which is 1.645. And what we want to know is if our t statistic that we calculated earlier, 3.95, is larger than this t critical value here of 1.645, which indeed it is. And so we conclude that we are going to reject our null hypothesis that there's no difference between this population of white women and the population overall, and conclude that there is a difference and that white women do make more than the population of women overall at a 0.05 level. So again, we have computed our test, st test statistic calculate our degrees of freedom, and we have an alpha of 0.05. Since we are doing 
A one-tail test the t-critical value in our table, that way we just showed, is 1.645. Since this value is smaller than our calculated t-statistic of 3.95, we will reject the null hypothesis and conclude that white women, on average, make more money than the population of all women at the 0.05 significance level. Finally, let's look at an example where we're comparing two sample proportions. So in this example, we're looking at the proportion of first generation Hispanic Americans to earn a college degree is 0.15. The proportion of second generation Hispanic Americans to earn a college degree is 0.2. And we want to know, do these two populations differ in terms of the proportion that earned a college degree? And so our assumptions are going to be that we have two independent samples of n greater than 50 and n2 to greater than 50, and that the level of measurement is nominal. Next, we're going to state our hypotheses and our alpha value. So our research hypothesis is there is a difference between the two population proportions. So we're going to be doing a two-tail test because we're stating that there's a difference. We're not saying if one is greater than the other, we're just stating that these two population proportions are different. Therefore, our null hypothesis is going to be that there is no difference between the two population proportions, that they're going to be relatively equal, we'll again assume the same sort of alpha or significance level of 0.05. Next we're going to select the sampling distribution and t-statistic. Because we're working with proportions and we have sample sizes that are over 50 or at least 50, we can assume that the sampling distribution of the proportion approaches normal, which means we can use z-statistics or z-scores. And so we're going to start to do those calculations. So first we're going to calculate the pooled standard error of a proportion. So here we have p sub 1 times 1 minus p sub 1 divided by n plus 1 or n sub 1 excuse me plus p sub 2 times 1 minus p sub 2 divided by n sub 2 and that's going to give us 0.15 so the proportion for our first sample times 1 minus 0.15 divided by 50 again the number of cases for our first sample plus 0.2 the proportion for our second sample times 1 minus 0.2 divided by 50, the number of cases for our, our second sample. And after we do those calculations, we end up with a pooled standard error of the proportion of 0 0.076. So we're going to plug that calculated pooled standard error of the proportion into our z score or z statistic calculation. And we're going to get 0.15, that proportion for our first sample minus 0.2, the proportion for our second sample, divided by 0 0.076. And that's going to be equal to negative 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.076. Um, this should be negative 0.66, excuse me. That should be a negative. That's a mistake on my part. Either way, it doesn't matter too much because when we go and look this up in our z table, it's not going to matter whether it's negative or positive. We're going to be able to look up our z score and find that 0.66 has an area beyond z here. This is that area that's in the tail. The chance of that type 1 error here is going to be 0.2546 times 2, which is going to be 0.5092. That's going to be much, much larger than our alpha of 0 0.05. So whenever we're looking to compare a z-score um, p-value to a alpha value, we're going to take the area beyond z for a two-tail test, it's just going to be the area beyond z times 2. For one-tail test, it's just the area beyond z. So for a two-tail test, we'll take that area beyond z and multiply it by 2 to get that p-value. And for a one-tail test, we'll just take that area beyond z and compare it to our alpha. And that area beyond z will be our p-value for a one-tail test. So what this means is that because our obtained z-score of 0.66 indicates that the difference between the two proportions is not enough to be statistically significant at the 0.05 level because our z-score of 0.66 has an area beyond the z of 0.2546 which again multiplied by 2 because we're doing a two-tail test leaves us with a p-value of 0.5092 again much larger than our alpha of 0.05. Because our p-value is larger than our alpha we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means that we can't say that these two populations are different. We must assume that these two populations, first generation Hispanic college graduates and second generation Hispanic college graduates, are the same.
that those proportions are the same, they are not different in a statistically significant way. Anyway, I hope this lesson helped you understand hypothesis testing, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you.